the first notion I had of Blake 7 was actually not even knowing what it was called. I think, I, I think I've got in my mind, I called it Blake 77. I don't know where the other seven came in, but however, it was up on our board in the visual effects office as a, a new series, new science fiction series. And uh, I was a, a new designer then, uh, just been made up from assistant, and uh, Ian Schoons had started on the series and discovered that it was actually becoming too much for one designer. And so could somebody else come onto it? And so I was chosen, or I volunteered, I can't really remember now. So I came onto this strange new series, Blake 7. I suppose I've always had an interest with the factual side of spacecraft, astronautics, rocketry and things like that. And when I was worked for television news, it was at a time, this will date me, it was a time when BBC Two was just in colour, BBC One was just about to go into colour, and they worked on the logic that um, everything had to be in colour. Bad colour was preferable to good black and white. And so all pictures had to be colour. And as I said, I worked in, in the photo library, and we had a lot of photographs of spacecraft in colour, but a number of particularly Soviet ones, and some American as well. Not, they were still black and white, or they were drawings. And so I, I sort of developed up this habit of going home at night, unpaid, um, making a model of the object, Apollo or whatever, Cosmos, photographing it with very relatively crude 35mm camera, uh, taking it in the following day, processing the film, we'd use it on the, on the news that night. I think I had, my record was 15 pictures in one news broadcast, which was Apollo 12. Um, and because I've had this interest in spacecraft, I suppose I try and adapt the models to actually suit the uh, a fantasy scenario. I mean, just, just for an example, let, if we take one of my favourites, which is the shuttle, Atlay shuttle from Blake 7. OK, it's, it's purely fictional, but I've tried to sort of have some sort of logic. It, it's, got a, it's got a front, a middle and an end. You know, the, the front has got the crew compartment, the end's got the engines. Slightly clichéd, I know, but people do expect to see a spaceship that looks like a spaceship on the screen. If you try and be two way out, you, you're in danger of actually losing the whole idea of what the image is supposed to be in the first place. models that still survive actually do get used every now and again, more as a joke than anything else, I think. This uh, is the London. Any Blake fan will know this one. Still got the name on the side, even. Um, which I reused recently in Space Vets, which is a junior... I call it Junior Red Dwarf, actually, because it's done in the same sort of way, but done for children's television. And they wanted a prison ship, so I thought, well, we've still got the London. The London was a prison ship, so it was never named, but those who know will actually know that. Deliverance, we reused the shape of a model, although made a new model. It was actually the shape that arrived in Time Squad. And for the full size piece of scenery, they used the same one and repainted it. It's a rocket launch pad. What do you make of it? I'm not sure. Pillow, take a look round. This is the specification. It's fast but short range. It has a life support capability of about 100 space hours. Wait for me. This particular model was made from fiberglass. Uh, a mould was taken. Um, plastic was used as well. It means that we can also fit the power pack for the little miniature explosion charge there. The explosion registered 1.3. Disturbance peaked at 115. We had probes on the front which always get bent. And we flew the whole lot on wires on occasion because it fell off the wires. This actually ejected two pods. This is one of the original solid wood pods. They were, these ones were purposely made solid because we actually dropped them out the 
the roof of the model stage towards camera, filming very, very fast. So you had the impression of these two escape pods falling towards you, towards the planet. To clear up the rumours that often run around Lake Seven, this is the remains of the original Liberator. And as you can see, it is genuinely the remains, as it was at the end of season three, with the gun still on it. It was actually dissembled to build the commercial kit of it, which I suppose that's the only example we've got of a Liberator being in full, uh, full skies now. <laughs> This is the engine, the remains of the engine. The power source was very mysterious, it was a photo flood bulb. Photo floods are very hot, so the engine melts. And this was rebuilt many, many times actually, probably at least half a dozen times in the life history. This original sphere as drawn wasn't a sphere. I think the correct term is an oblate spheroid, a bit like an orange when you sat on it. And, um, but it was much easier to make it as a sphere. And so actually, this was actually just a genuine Two hemispheres of perspex, tinted green, and with a, the stripes applied to it. It's as simple as that. An image of a spaceship, like the Liberator on the screen, can be done in various many ways. I mean, using a model is actually only one way. Some things can be done with cutouts of a model or even artwork animated against the background. It's done in movies, it's done in television. Some of the earlier shots, in fact, for Blake were done as two-dimensional artwork of the or photographs of the Liberator against the background. I tended to want to do them in three dimensions, so I tended to redo a lot of the liberator right to left, liberator left to right type of shots. Sustained. Level five. Ah! For the episode where the liberator returned home to Space World in the episode Redemption, they wanted a, a version of the liberator gun, the pain gun, so we came up with this rather um, pretty device. And it was at a time when electronics were changing. In the old days, you'd have sort of rickety motors turning switches and going click, 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 using a lot of current and uh, produce this sort of flashing light effect. This is actually one of the new devices which use solid state transistors, heaven forbid, which are all built, actually built into it. Unfortunately, it wasn't that modern. It still needed this battery pack to run it. All malfunctions have now been rectified. Systems are fully operational. Lock onto docking flight path. Confirm. Release. <laughs> the Liberator design actually spawned another craft. This is also from the episode Redemption. And they used the same sphere. These were supposed to be fighter versions. They had the same trouble with the prongs, which were always getting bent. And basically, they were just the weapon pod version of the Liberator, and there was the two of them. They had the same light source in the back, which had the same problems that if you left them on for too long, they melted. For season two, I tended to do just the model filming. I did a couple of studios as well, whereas my colleagues Peter Pregham and Andy Lazell did the studios. So we were actually sort of preempting what actually is becoming the norm now. We actually sort of did it probably for the first time. So it did mean that I could actually get a file together of, of various uh, drawings, photographs, proper shot lists of things, of actually what was going to actually be happening within any, any particular storyline. Well done, General. Information. Sensors register secondary launch. A space vehicle in pursuit. 
not. I suppose the second most famous ship after the Liberator were the Pursuit ships. The Liberator was the good ears, the Pursuit ships were the bad ears. Now, we had two sizes of these. This actually is, the larger one, is actually one of the vacuum form ones that would have been blown up. I'm not quite sure how this one survived. Normally, if it's available to be blown up, we'll blow it up. This one actually has survived, more or less, but you can see the, the lightweight structure, or the flimsy structure of that particular one. This is the little tiny Pursuit ship that would be used for more distant shots. I often get asked, well somebody asked me once, uh, what do you actually build the models out of? In which the easy reply is anything and everything. Um, the days are still there when we go down to the local Woolworths or whatever or DIY store and we rummage around and look for things like, oh it's a nice lampshade, that will make a nice spaceship. On the logic that really a spaceship can be anything. There's a ship, it's coming in for a surface landing. Have they spotted you? I've got the detector shield up. What sort of a ship is it? I don't know. It's a new type to me. It was on the screen for approximately one and a half seconds. Now, you can't really justify spending a lot of money building a model for one and a half seconds on the screen, so I basically took two hair drives and stuck them together. On the screen, you never saw there were two hair drives. Unfortunately, stupid fool that I am, on my one of my then original swap shop programs, I actually gave the game away, and because nobody will let me forget it now that these are in fact two hair dryers flying away through space. The effects on Blake were like any other effects program in that they were a team effort. So we had several people working on it over the, particularly over the four seasons. I, Ian Schoon started. I came in on season one. Uh, myself, Peter Pogram, Andy Lazell did season two, and for season three and four, other people like Jim Francis, Steve Druitt, Andy again, and Mike Kelt came in also to cover it. So it was, it, there was a fair number of people actually covering the various effects over the complete four seasons. Working on Blake was an experience, I think I can put it down to it. It was the first big science fiction series, apart from Doctor Who, that I'd worked on. My real wish is I see the stuff coming out on video now and I would really like to have the opportunity of saying, let's do that again using modern technology. <laughs> <laughs>